Welcome to another Café Realist, uh, uh, my opportunity to have pleasant conversation with people I wish I could see more often and I don't see at all because of the, the lockdown. Uh, David, thanks for joining us. Hi there, it's great, great, good to be on, thank you very much. Yeah, well it's been a, it's been a while, it, uh, it was episode 16 I think about Star Trek you joined us for. Oh blimey, that's going back a bit. Yeah, I'd almost forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that was just that was a while ago. That was just before you stopped working on Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, yeah, typ typical. I did, I did, I did a Brian Fuller. I think is the the way of pulling it. <laughs> oh, that, that's classy. <laughs> well, I I hope. Well, taste. Uh, I hope um, uh, Modifus didn't pull a, a discovery behind. <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 no! That was it was it was purely me. Um, I, I the, the the people at Modifius are, are, are wonderful. They 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 did everything, and they they, they let me look. They, they let me look after almost every element of it, from the miniature design to the, the logos and the covers and everything like that. It was fantastic, and it's just the trying to trying to balance that with a day job. It was like I was doing seven days a week and and then some, and it, I just burnt out. So I thought it best if I I said farewell to it and um, let somebody with a bit more time look after it and put some more care into it than I could dedicate. Could you introduce yourself for people who are not familiar with your work? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm David F. Chapman. That's my um, pen name, as they say. Um, everybody calls me Dave. Um, I have written mostly for uh, Eden Studios for things like uh, Conspiracy X, uh, Terra Primate, Buffy, All Flesh Must Be Eaten, and things like that. Uh, and then um, I'm probably better known for working for Cubicle 7 for um, designing their Doctor Who RPG, um, the Vortex system, which has gone on to be used in other things like uh, Primeval and uh, Rocket Age. Uh, and other than that, I also um, do my own stuff and also creator of um, a crazy web initiative called RPG A Day, which runs in uh, August every year and is currently coming up to its seventh year. Wow. It's getting very close. Uh, last year, I think last year was the time I did the most with it. I did TikToks, I did uh, Patreon episodes. Uh, I'm not sure I will have time to be so dedicated this year. <laughs> Doesn't seem like well, much TikTok of well. answering a question <laughs> every day. That's a, that's a lot of work. Yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, it, it was a, it was a strange thing because it kind of it came about from um, I was what, looking online and there was a thing called uh, Book a Day that one of the book publishers in the UK was doing. And um, I, I was going through the questions. Thought, oh, I'll join in on this. This will be a bit of a laugh. And half of my answers were RPG books. And it was like, what's your what's your favorite book? And it's like, well, well, this one, the Star Wars RPG by West End Games, that's my favorite. And it's like, hang on, shouldn't there be one that's like this for RPGs? And it just kind of escalated from there, which was quite nice. <clears throat> I, really like, I really like your what you did last year, which was, since you were sort of running out of questions after six years, you started doing prompts instead. So it was single words to inspire people to do anything, uh, really. Yeah, I, I, that kind kind of came about because I saw the the success of Inktober, and there's so many people on my my Twitter feed who are illustrators doing great artwork for things like Critical Role or um, character creations for for other people, and I thought, oh, you know, we should get some illustrators in there to try and do things, and having a question like what's your the your first science fiction rpg you can't really answer that with a picture so i thought oh, no if we... and it saves me coming up with new questions every year as well well i say me um, me and um and anthony uh, who kind of co, co does it with me now <laughs> so have you worked out already your list for this year we've got a preliminary list which um I usually come up with a, a, a load of random words. Uh, Anthony looks at them and goes, you know, these could be a little bit better and then sits there and tweaks them all. <laughs> uh, and we, so we've got a, a list of ones that we're kind of on and about at the moment, which I think we're going to go with. 
uh, which we will put online um, the end of this month, hopefully, um, so that everybody's got like a month to build up to to the August things. Uh, if you need to record any videos, uh, podcasts, or do the illustrations in advance, and you've got a bit of time to prepare for it as well, which is always handy. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, maybe uh, I should do that. <laughs> maybe then I will have a a, a, a tenuous chance of uh, meeting the brief. <laughs> So, uh, we've got a, a couple of ice-breaking questions on Café Rollist, uh, which started as a result of the lockdown and uh, mm -hmm. me needing to, hang, to have meaningful conversations with people but being locked inside. Uh, as, <laughs> what is your routine like at the moment? Is it still impacted or has it been uh, impacted in any way by, by the lockdown? Uh, quite a lot because I, I, I work in a what they call a non-essential retail establishment normally as my day job so they've reopened again today thanks to the, um, the lift of some of the restrictions um, so it's really been 10 weeks almost of staying at home which has been nice because I've been able to do some writing uh, but my routine has been mostly getting up late because I can't get to sleep because <laughs> the brain's too busy uh, and then catching up on the, the horrible news of the day and then sitting there staring at a computer screen thinking I know I should be writing but Facebook is open instead and I really should do some work uh, yeah, yeah it's been mostly that I should imagine uh, but, but thankfully managed to get some words done in these last 10 weeks it's going to be strange going back to a day job again there's probably research on the subject, but it's so weird how uh, I don't have that that often lately. But I'm I'm, start, I'm trying to write a game at the moment, and by writing a game, starting having ideas for another game. But uh, yeah, during the day nothing comes, and then I go to bed. It's uh, almost midnight, and I got my notebook next to my coffee table, uh, my uh, my bed yeah. table, and. Uh, I have to wake up to leave the, the bedroom so my wife can sleep and I go in the living room and then suddenly uh, I write, I write, I write, I write for an hour and then and then it's gone. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, I have the notebook at the side of the bed, a little pile of post-it notes and um, managed to find these pens that have got uh, little tiny torches built into the to the nib. Wow. So I, when, you, when, when you click it on, it just lights up enough for you to, to write in the dark. So <laughs> I should I get one of the these. Up. <laughs> Maybe I, I was looking for a, a, a way to uh, insert a joke about uh, Primark today. So for people who are not familiar, apparently there's a, there's a, not an actual riot, but a very long queue to get into uh, Primark and Nike stores at Oxford Street right now. And I, I just don't get it. I mean, I shopped at Primark. <laughs> the urgency of it I just I don't I don't understand what's going on but that's that's yeah. life no, I, I clothes shop like maybe once every four or five years it's like if you don't wear it out it's fine so if it still fits so so why the urgency after only 10 weeks I don't know <laughs> well I do remember once going to Primark with urgency it was when it was the first place I stayed in when I moved to London. Uh, my wife was still uh, in Belgium. I was living here alone. And the place I found where I really needed just a place to to land, you know, to then to find something mm -hmm. more appropriate. But the place I found and landed into, turns out I was introduced to uh, uh, tiny little critters, which I, I was really not aware of on the continent, called bed bugs. So, oh, yes. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah. So I found a friend who was willing to uh, have me for a couple of nights while the situation was sorted. But I did rush to Primark to buy cheap clothes and linen to <laughs> replace everything <laughs> I have left in this dreadful place. Um, <laughs> the other uh, routine question, uh, not routine. Um, Lockdown question is, have you picked up any new uh, hobby, skills? I know today you are introduced to Zoom or new uh, overlords in the world. Yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah this, is, this is my first time. <laughs> <laughs> have you picked any new skills or interests or hobby uh, lately? Uh, I don't think I've picked up any new skills. I think the only I might have 
learnt to not do something. Um, I've been a terrible nail biter um, since since childhood, and thanks to not not touching your face, <laughs> I think um, I may after nearly well, well, fifty years worth of it. Um, I might have stopped biting my fingernails. <laughs> that's, imp- that's impressive, but at the same time, as you mentioned, touching your face, I have to touch touch my own because it's, get, it's getting scratchy. Uh, as as I'm saying that, um, so uh, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, the stuff you can talk well, of because you mentioned uh, some uh, exclusive <coughs> scoops before. Oh, blimey! <laughs> it's a combination of uh, three things at the moment. Um, so as of about two two or three months ago, I uh, became line developer for uh, Doctor Who for Cubicle 7. Um, so we've been working on the next stuff for that, which I'm not sure I can really talk about yet, but let's just say it's, uh, it's, it's going to be technically the next edition um, for the new Doctor, uh, and there's going to be some... Um, revisions to the rules uh, for the first time in about 10 years. So is that the new, because I, I'm not up to date with the first, the, well, the doctors and then uh, the line at Cubicle 7, so you always have a book or supplement for each doctor, so is it going to be the one about the Jody Whittaker doctor then? Or It'll is be it... a, a new core book to start to start with um, and usually when the, when the actors finished their run as that doctor uh, then there'll be a, a, a book to add to the, to the little catalogue of Doctor source books, while the core book moves on to the next Doctor. Do they <laughs> do they all fit in a nice TARDIS shaped uh, box set? Uh... Um, they, not so much in a, in a TARDIS shape, but the the previous twelve Doctor source books, the the spines all join up, nice. so they look really nice on the shelf. <laughs> It's like it's like um, your James Bonds there. You got your complete collection, and you bought your complete mm-hmm. collection when they released the last Pierce Brosnan one. And now you got the few others <laughs> which don't quite match, and you would need to rebuy the complete collection. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a shame that, but yes. <laughs> so have no, you... I, know, I know I know exactly what you mean. So uh, cool. Doctor Who, that, that's actually interesting. Is it? How popular is it with, for instance, I don't know if you're aware of that, with the U- US audience? Because uh, I was not a Whovian. Uh, it turns out Doctor Who is not a thing, uh, or at least it wasn't in France and Belgium. Uh, I don't think it was shown regularly somewhere, just like Star Trek wasn't really a thing either, uh, but Doctor Who even less. But it seems like it's, it's grown in popularity uh, overseas, uh, across the pond in, in the US. So, is this something you see with the role-playing game as, as well? Or are there a lot of US players? I, I honestly don't know. I think so. I mean, it's certainly the TV series has, has um, grown in popularity, and certainly when Matt Smith started, um, there was a definite push from the BBC to get it over into the States even, even more, uh, and that seemed to pay off. Um, I don't know what it's like at the moment. How how popular the game is in over in the states. You'd have to ask um, ask Dom about that rather than me. <laughs> uh, and uh, you, <laughs> I, I don't know what to reply to that. You mentioned also an incep <laughs> in an Inception inspired game. Uh, what is that about? Because that one I don't know anything about. Oh, oh uh, in- Inception esque. You said not not in- Inception inspired, but Inception esque or. In the yeah, Dreamlands, yeah. Uh, uh, I've been working on a game called Wild for about eight years now. Um, Wild standing for um, Wake Initiated Lucid Dreaming, uh, and it's a game very he- heavily inspired by Inception and um, things like The Matrix. So you use technology to um, hook up in DreamShare, basically. Uh, so. It also incorporates weirdness along the lines of Neil Gaiman's comics, uh, The Sandman, and things like that. Uh, and I, I say I've been working on that for about eight years now. Uh, it's got a tarot card-based mechanic rather than dice, uh, 
and uh, a good friend of mine, Stu, has decided that he's foolishly going to um, help me publish it, hopefully sometime this year. Uh, rather than the full core book, we're going to go for something a bit smaller, which is like a, a starter thing to see how it goes. And that's going to be playable both with a GM or solo, um, using the cards as defining what the game is. That's getting also more popular. Well, that was definitely something people were talking a lot at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, playing uh, solo or just one-on-one. -on -one, uh, uh, have you have you played a lot of games uh, shaped like that yourself? Not not so much. I did a bit of research on it uh, about a year ago when I first I, when I first got. Um, tuned into it basically uh, and i saw that there was a, a lot of these journaling games starting up where you rather than play with a gm or anything like like that you're using the cards to inspire you to almost write fiction which i thought was was, was brilliant especially if you haven't got a gaming group at the, at the time you just crack open this usually quite a small book um flip open playing cards or, or roll a dice and you're almost using that as an inspiration to to create a short story which is genius i love i love the idea of that but um yeah yeah i kind of was inspired heavily by that uh but hopefully it'll be playable both like that and as a traditional game of the gm so are you going because crossed. that's that's something uh i'm planning a kickstarter uh, people advise me to do a quick start and have the quick start in the hands of people and then I can do a kick start. So is that sort of your plan also to have this quick start out, get people interested, get their precious emails and then <laughs> and then do a Kickstarter a, a year or so later? Um possibly. I don't I don't know how it's working. Stu's done a couple of games before. Uh one was just like a quick start for his game called Aegean, which is a mythological ancient Greece type type RPG. And then recently he kickstarted one of those uh, tiny RPGs for the Zine Quest. He did one called, uh, called the Gaslight Club, which is basically Westworld, but instead of it being the Old West as the main setting for the theme park, it was 1920s New, New York in a uh, a nightclub and you play as the hosts uh, and you gradually realize as events keep looping round and round that you're you're repeating the same sort of narrative storyline over and over again for different people and you realize that you're a you're a host and become self-aware and try and escape uh oh bless you <laughs> uh, but yeah he, he put that on kickstarter to see how how it would go and that did really well so i think he's planning on the starter being a Kickstarter as well, just to see how it goes. It'll probably be about 100, 120 pages um, hardback uh, in a weird square format, because I, I love square books. Um, I did a, oh, reaching over to the shelves now. I did, I did a like a, a, a sample version of it, um, which came out a bit like that, which was, was published by, which was printed by a really nice company called um, Inky Little Fingers. And um, they do such great work. With, I think we're going to go along that sort of line for it. Do you have some uh, art in mind or someone already you, you hired? Because when you mentioned Sandman, uh, going into the dreams of people, or even Inception, it's it's visually very rich. Is this something you, you're going to look mm. into for, for the game? Well, what what are your plans with that? We've, um, we've already commissioned the cover art. Uh, it was an, art, an, an artist called... Um, Christina Casada, if I remember rightly, she, uh, she she is an artist who works under the name of Kissus, uh, Q I S S U S, um, and she did the um, covers for the Magicians comics that came out quite recently. Oh wow! Boom, and her artwork's just gorgeous. It's it's very um, Art Nouveau, um, flowy gorgeous stuff um i've i've put the uh put the initial cover image up on uh the the wild um, facebook page so you can have a sneak peek but yeah it's really rather lovely uh, it was one of those things where i've been working on this for about eight years and always thought 
you know if i if, if we paid for a cover artist and i know i've we've put some money into it and i'd better finish the darn thing rather than constantly putting it off so now we've got the cover art i'm, I'm committed because Stu's paid for that and i i have to have to deliver him the, the words to go with it now <laughs> <laughs> well, it's such a powerful way to communicate also with people. I mean, from the moment I purchased just two little pieces of art uh, from from an artist for my own game, immediately it's a thing, you know. It's 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 not quite. Mm. Uh, I was reading. I think it was Jason Pitt who was recommending people when they're working on a book to create a Photoshop mock-up of the book because it would encourage yeah. you to pursue it because you visualize what you are trying to to create uh so yeah you said you you worked on that for eight years now and i was curious within those eight years how soon did you start or did, did you did you play test the game and started you know having friends and, and strangers to play the game and see uh how, how it went with them yeah yeah at various stages it's it kind of evolves from I think the first version of the game when I first started writing it, it was very heavily inspired by the Doctor Who rules because that's what I, I had in my head a lot from working on that. And since then, it has evolved so so dramatically. I even it got to the pitch where I had because um, it's all dreams based. I had this idea about the, the game system using dice, and the, the game system is going to be called rapid die movement <laughs> so it was a bit of a pun on the, the rem the rapid eye movement thing i thought oh yeah rapid die movement that'd be that's such a such a great pun um and now i don't have dice in it so i can't even use that as a name for the system so. <laughs> but, but yeah it has evolved about five or six times through through the years and we pl we played it most recently about three or four months ago in between Tales from the Loop games, and um, yeah, it was it was bonkers. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it was it was good, but very 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 surreal. So, do you think uh, there will be opportunities to uh, to play the game? I don't know at Dragon Meet at the end of the year or something like that. Are you are you planning public demonstration of the game? Hopefully, although I'm a terrible GM. Um, I I used to be. I used to do nothing but GM, but now now I'm sticking with playing, I think. Um, but Stu, who um, is publishing it, um, is our GM for our game group. We do it all over over Skype because he's based up in Glasgow. Uh, and, yeah, he's he's been quite keen to, to run it at conventions. I think he was hoping that we had a playtestable version running for UK Games Expo um, before it um, got cancelled. So, so hopefully the next big convention, probably Dragon Meet, if that goes ahead, touch wood. Um, if if Dragon Meet goes ahead, we might have some some playable versions of it by then. Touching wood uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know uh, what I found out about is uh, there's a lot. Well, Origins Online just got cancelled, but uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, online conventions and online opportunities to to run games, and it's. You know, on one hand, sure, you're not around people the same way you would physically, but when you want to de make demonstration of a game, it's actually very straightforward and liberating to be able to say, okay, mm. this is a time wherever you are in the world, you can join and play the game. And yeah, I'm very curious to see when Virtual Expo is gonna, or I think it's called Virtually Expo, something like that. Uh, mm. They're gonna, they're gonna open up submissions for for games because i don't think those are open it, they're, they're very sparse on details at the moment i'm supposed to have a panel <laughs> there uh i mean uh, it's not a criticism because it's such a big endeavor first to mm. cancel their convention physical convention and then to launch an online one but uh, it's still a bit uh, mysterious <laughs> At this point. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of new for everybody, I think. So, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they go with that. But but that's that's a, a, a side effect from having this lockdown is I'm actually gaming more than I have in years, which is quite surreal. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm I'm playing tonight <laughs> with people from the Gauntlet, uh, mm -hmm. and I had to cancel another game to be able to join that game. 
because I, I want to run games at the gauntlet. So no, I want to play games at the gauntlet so I can be allowed to run games at the gauntlet, uh, which is which is a win-win regardless. But yeah, I'm I'm playing twice per week on a regular week. So it's yeah, and my good. wife is playing more twice per week other games as well. So it's it's really intense. I'm supposed to run seven games next weekend. Uh, which which that, see that's intense. <laughs> well, it's a it's a short format game. The game I'm developing. It's two hours is enough for a session. It's uh, mm -hmm. zero prep, so it's not like I'm uh, I don't know to say hello uh, to a fellow game designer, a uh, friend of the show. It's not like I'm developing Nibiru and I'm running Nibiru <laughs> and trying to to have something mysterious oh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, with each session. No, it's a uh, it's kind of a uh, humoristic. Fart fart sound and <laughs> kind of game, uh, and most of the energy is brought by the players. It's GM less technically. I facilitate the game, but uh, there's not even a a GMing per se. I read bits of script, and uh, and then we also. <laughs> I I didn't uh, set the bar too high for my first ever venture in uh, in game design. So oof. that's good. But we should play sometimes together. When do you have a spot for me on one of your games? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll definitely pencil you in. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's weird because I was going to say that, that the um, I've been managing to actually go back and play first edition D and D um, with my old game group that I last played D and D with them about thirty five years ago. It's funny, um, I, I did the same, <laughs> but, but for my game, it's, my game group was more like 15, 14, 16 years ago. Uh, but I hope you you had a better time than me. I mean, the, 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 these are lovely people, but I found out that they still played the way we played 16 years ago. And that I found out also that actually I didn't like it very much. So it was great as a platform <laughs> for me to get into role playing games, but now I found out that I don't like it. And... <laughs> and maybe I never did like it the way we played. <laughs> so I left the campaign. I was like, okay, guys you, you, and girls, you're having a, a fun. Apparently, I, I'm not having so much fun. So I'm going to play something else <laughs> think, instead. Think, it's just, just appeals to me because it's kind of nostalgic because we haven't really changed the way we play um, that D&D &D since since. For the last thirty-five I mean, years, it, it's not up. it's not so much a criticism <laughs> I, I, it, because the yeah. table, everybody but me, was having fun. So <laughs> it's not it's not that it's badly played. It's just that it's not what I my tastes have changed, or I, I had a be, have a better idea of what I like now. So it's it's not supposed to be judgmental. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, tell yeah. me uh, about playing like it was twenty-five years ago uh, online, but but online. Uh it's it's weird because it's like um, we're we're playing it on roll twenty. Um, it's this, it's the same group that I, I've known since. Oh, since I think some of the members I've I've known since about five or six. Um, so so yeah, I've known them for decades, uh, and they've kind of all split up and gone around the country. Some of them are in Australia and New Zealand, some are in the states, but we all managed to come together and still. Um, form this little marching order regulated party going through a, a ready-made dungeon that uh, our DM is still writing D&D &D for first edition even now and putting putting that out um, under the publication name of uh, Dunroman University Press because um, his, his setting is called Dunroman um, and um, yeah it's, it's been great you know staggering around corridors and fighting ghouls and whites and things like that it's just it's just like being 15 again <laughs> it's quite surreal but when, I, when I'm not playing that um, I, the other games we play are, are quite a, a lot more narrative based well I mean I'm playing Tales from the Loop as well which which I absolutely adore Tales from the Loop uh, and that is co completely the polar opposite from AD&D uh, I, I honestly look at the AD because I've still got my old player's handbook from from childhood and looking through that and going, how did I ever understand this when I was a teenager? I can't, I can't be bothered to read all these rules. <laughs> I want the rules down into, down to about sixteen pages, like Tales from the Loop. I don't want like 
books and books of it. I'm too lazy and too old for that kind of shenanigans now. <laughs> well, Star Wars D6 was like that for me. I got the book, I didn't know what was a role-playing game. And then I got the book, I read it with my mother. I was like 13. And we were like, what is this thing? It's, it sounds like a board <laughs> game, but it's, where's the board? Where's the game? It's just oh. the the game rules, and I never managed to, to, to quite run it on my own. I didn't even know there were mm. adventure books until much later. It it was really weird being alone with a book uh, without the internet back then. <laughs> oh God, yes, yeah. Oh, although um, Star Wars D six, the West End Games one, I I still love that one. I I do love the the old West End Games D six system. Ghostbusters was one of the first things I I tried writing for back in the late 80s i, I um, wrote a couple of scenarios for ghostbusters uh, on a on a old electric typewriter and, and photocopied manuscripts and posted them off to new york in the late 80s to say oh, look i really want to write rpgs and especially as this one's funny as well uh, it wasn't well, that one wasn't a chore to read uh, and, and yeah, it's, that, that's that's where it all really started. So I do have a bit of a soft spot for West End games. It's a real pity that uh, that IP never got picked up afterwards, because I, I hear a lot yeah. of good things of Ghostbuster D6, and I played it as part of online grog meet uh, a while ago. Uh, it was mm -hmm. it was really fun, and the, the the system is yeah very straightforward and nice. But it's funny Ghostbusters is quite popular. I think it lends itself very well to a role-playing game, unlike other IPs of the time. Like I think uh, Back to the Future, for instance. Having a Back to the Future role-playing game, it's a bit too centered on a set of specific individuals. But you take Ghostbusters, yeah, they they branch out, so you you open a branch of the the Ghostbusters. I, I don't understand why. I guess it's a question of copyright, but I don't know why they were never. There's no more recent sequel to that. Well, it, it's it's a weird one because uh, a couple of Dragon Meets ago, I got I, I arrived at at Dragon Meet and Dom Dominic McDowell from Cubicle Seven sort of grabbed me the moment I walked in the front door and said, "Look, we're we're doing a podcast," and dragged me off down into this fire exit. It was like I haven't seen him in in a couple of years and didn't know what what was going on, and we sat down and did this podcast about the Doctor Who RPG. And right in the middle of this podcast, uh, the, the guy asking us the questions uh, from this podcast called uh, Wibbly Wobbly Dicey Wicey, uh, which is especially about the Doctor Who RPG. And he, he took, turns around and says, so are there any RPGs, that any licenses that you went for and didn't get? And Dom immediately comes out with saying that, that um, they almost got Ghostbusters. And I was just like sitting there in the middle of this podcast with my jaw dropped. Like, <laughs> what? Why did, why did you not talk to me about this? But apparently they, they got the approvals from Sony and Sony were really, really happy about it all, really, really keen. And it was almost going to go, go ahead. And uh, Mattel stopped in. Uh, they, Mattel basically said, look, we do all the Ghostbusters toys and games. And from what we can see, this is a game. So technically we should do it. And you can't have it. <laughs> and and a role play game don't make enough money to interest Mattel compared to doing a board no, game or no. an action figure or something like that. It's a, it's. I, a, I don't know if that. I was just wondering if that might have changed because IDW now do board games for for Ghostbusters and things like that, and I'm sure they're not as huge as a, a, as as Mattel would kind of want, and Mattel kind of let them do that. I don't know. Maybe worthwhile having another try. I think. Ghostbusters yeah. is a great license to do. There's weird things like that. Like I think it's, I think it's Star Wars with Fantasy Flight games. They cannot. There's something about they cannot do digital content like PDF versions mm. of their games, because the copyright to doing video games actually is so worded in a way that it says that nobody else can do digital content but other people. So although they say, well, look, this digital content, it's not actually a digital product. It's just a digital version of our tabletop game. Uh, they, are, yeah. they are still forbidden 
to uh, to sell on the, on drive through and so on as as far as i know so you won't find you can yeah. find legend of the five rings on on drive through but you won't find edge of the empire and and so on because it, there's weird copyright issues over there it it's it's a tough one to get into when we first uh pitched to the bbc for doctor who uh, there was there was uh, me uh, angus abranson uh, chris birch uh, Dominic McDowell. Um, we were all sitting in this um, office at the BBC, and we sh- we'd we'd sent them a pitch document, and they were quite interested. And we showed them. Um, I, I'd brought the Buffy RPG along with me because that's basically what we wanted to do, something like the the big Buffy core book. And the BBC were were looking at it, and they were going, "This is great. We really want to do this, but it's a book, and technically." Uh, books are licensed, Doctor Who books are Random House and BBC books. So, yeah, we can't do it as a book. And luckily, at that pitch, I had the uh, the old West End game Xena and Hercules RPG with me, which is a box set with dice and uh, three or four books in it. <laughs> and waved that at them, and they said, if you do a box set with dice, that's that's a game, that's fine, we can do that. Uh, and so that's why the first couple of supplements um, and the first version of the Dot Two RPG was a box set, just to get around the whole um, BBC books thing. And luckily, that kind of got resolved, uh, and now we can do books, which is nice. So, so now <laughs> what you need to do is go to Mattel and tell them it's an educational tool <laughs> about improvisational yes. writing revolving around <laughs> Ghostbusters. A game? No, 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 no! It's not supposed to be a game. It's not fun. It's not fun. Look at look at the inside of this book. There's math in mm-hmm. there, there, so it's yes. not it's not a game. <laughs> and what could be more educational than Ghostbusters? <laughs> I mean, you can learn about the history of your local place. You'd come up with a, this completely convoluted pitch to say, you know, look, it's not a game. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Just give us a copyright sign there. It says role playing. <laughs> Uh, a play, g- <laughs> not, not, not game, role playing tool, and uh, yeah, well, you're done. Don't worry about it. Anyway, we we won't make too oh. much money. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. What I I I've tried many a time to try and get the uh, the Harry Potter license, and uh, I think the last time we were trying to approach Warner Brothers about Harry Potter, I think the word role playing wasn't even used at all, um, just to try and. Sneak it in there. <laughs> storytelling, like, yeah. yeah. Storytelling game, or no, um, adventure game. Yeah, that's the other one. Yes, <laughs> interactive adventure. Oh, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Find it interesting that Cubicle Seven. I mean, I mean, it's great because I, I love the products by Cubicle Seven. But find it interesting that, for instance, Games Workshop has moved so far away from role playing games that they don't do their own role playing games. They they hand it out to Cubicle Seven. And, and again, I, I love mm-hmm. the the work there. Uh, but it's it's such a weird turn when you know all the history and I don't I don't know all of it but of Games Workshop that they they move so far away to and now they say no 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 we don't bother with that we do the miniatures <laughs> and we're gonna issue the rights to our friends at Cubicle Seven to do uh, the role playing game. It's it's strange they they kind of keep focusing and focusing until they're they're really down into their own little niche. I, I remember buying White Dwarf when it had supplements and, and adventures in it, in it for for all sorts of things like like star from tears and traveler and that's that's when i used to buy white dwarf in the moment they kind of focused on warhammer and warhammer 40k it's, that's when i stopped reading it really. it's Bit very it's very interesting when you you well a good place for people interested in that's it's the the grognard podcast by dirk the dice uh when you you oh. hear about the history of the role-playing community in, in in the UK is how White Dwarf was this big thing and then this was this sort of commercial treason set out of doing exclusively war gaming things and leaving behind role-playing games uh, almost completely it's yeah it, it you can really tell people were very attached to White Dwarf and that White Dwarf yeah left them behind what was a yeah sort of a trauma <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I remember uh, going over to reading uh, Imagine. I think yes. It was. 
yeah i used to read a lot of imagine as well that that was great especially because it had the little um pull out adventures on on the different colored paper in the middle i used to love that one as well but that didn't last very long if i remember right i don't think that was a very long runner at all magazine were a weird thing i mean like video game magazine like tell that to a younger kid <laughs> nowadays uh, hey you know he used to have video game magazine and you would have the the playthrough of a game side scroller mm -hmm. printed on on a page or you would write re read reviews of games in a in a magazine and have yeah cheat codes and so on uh it's it's just so odd now to think about that there's a there's a great scene in um uh if if there's any good scene in <laughs> tomorrow never dies i don't know if you ever seen that james bond movie but The, the big villain is a sort of a Murdoch, uh, Rupert Murdoch character. And at some point he says, yes. I control everything. Newspaper, radio, television, magazine. And <laughs> and it, it came out in 1999, something like that. So like three years mm -hmm. after that, it f already felt very weird that he was like stopping at magazine and there was no internet mention <laughs> at all. That would be yeah. I control everything: YouTube, Twitch, <laughs> TikTok, Facebook, <laughs> Vine. Oh yeah, we f forget about Vine. That's gone now. Hasn't gone. It? It's uh, TikTok yeah. now. <laughs> My MySpace. Uh, no. <laughs> oh MySpace. <laughs> yeah. huh? oh, um, uh, what is it? Get, uh, oh, hang on. I've got a copy here. Hang on. Talking of magazines, tabletop gaming still seems to be doing mm. all right. Though. I actually have an article in there. Whee! Oh, congratulations. <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> well played. Is there... A, uh, I'm sure there are, there's several, but what, what would be the, the one or two IPs you, you'd love to to bid for uh, and to, to get? Oh, God. Bes besides <laughs> Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, besides Harry Potter. Um, I, uh, I think probably it would either be uh, The Magicians, uh, Lev, Lev Grossman's The Magicians, Uh, that was an awesome TV series as well, but the books are great. And, and it's like Harry Potter, but at university uh, with a lot more swearing and sex. But yeah, it's <laughs> it's great. Um, I, I love the magicians and Lev Grossman. Is, you can you can really tell that he's a he's a gamer as well in his past, uh, just by reading the book. Um, and I think Twin Peaks. Oh, I'm wearing the Twin Peaks T-shirt today as well. Oh, cool. I think Twin Peaks would be the would be the other one because I, I, I love David Lynch, and but Twin Twin Peaks is still a, a massive obsession for me. Didn't uh, you? It's a, it, didn't you publish a Twin Peaks inspired game already? I think you mentioned no, that. No, no. I it was it was something I did back back when. Um, oh God, what was that company that used to do the? The Think Geek used to do all the, uh, the the spoof things for April Fool's Day, and then they they they'd see how popular it was. They they did like the the Tauntaun sleeping bag and stuff like that, and kind of inspired by that, I thought oh, I'll jump on that bandwagon and I'll, I'll I'll do some April Fool's Day RPGs just to see what the reaction is, see see if the the interest's there to actually go ahead with it. Um, and Twin Peaks was one of the ones that I did for that, along with um, a Stephen King one, because I, I think Stephen King would be a, the, the worlds of Stephen King would be a great RPG because it all kind of ties together with the Dark Tower, which would be, which would be fab. Uh, I, I think the first one that I, I put up as an April Fool's gag uh, was the Beatles, and I, I, I do think the Beatles would make a great RPG, <laughs> especially uh, if you look at. The, the movie movies like Help and uh, Yellow Submarine, it would just be great. It would just be just bonkers, but but be great with with musical moments, and you could have special custom dice with like John, Paul, George, and Ringo on the top as sixes, <laughs> and if you get get the right person on the top, yeah, it'd be great. I, I had it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, that that could be that could be a fun one. A uh, Beatles game, so a four player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and you, yeah, either it's four player or your four attributes are Paul, Ringo, uh, George, and uh, <laughs> and John. That, 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 <laughs> okay, that, you that roll, work, yeah? roll under John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be hilarious. 
but yeah, I, I, I do, I do love, um, love help as a movie. It's just really surreal when he's because uh, it's the one where Ringo's got the the ring on and the the cult are trying to kill him as a sacrifice, and it's just a ridiculous chase movie, basically. But that, would... that would make a great, great RPG. I mean, it could be a, a cool game. A, I'd love a game. I think a lot of people would like that. The the idea of a, you play a band, an up and coming band, and you start at the cave or somebody somewhere else. It doesn't have to be specifically Beatles, but you know, it's like the commitment. So there, there's 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 quite a different IPs with a small band and seek up and coming, and could be quite fun to uh, mm. to play and see uh, how you you go through things. I guess it could be a, a fiasco playset. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> with, just with less murder. <laughs> Have you ever tried uh, "Damn the Man, Save the Music"? No, no, but I, I, I was thinking about backing that one because that was a Kickstarter a while ago, and um, my wife's a big fan of uh, Empire Records, which it inspired the, the the name for it as well. But, uh, but yeah, that that was great. It's within the uh, bundle for racial justice. So if you pick the the bundle with this one thousand mm. game somewhere in there, damn the music is. So you can, maybe <laughs> so, somewhere in that massive list. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's diff it's become difficult to navigate, and now you've got three, four, five different people offering you ways to browse them with specific search <laughs> engines or Google Docs listing them all. Uh, it's uh, it's grown into uh, quite something. It's raised so much money as well. It's fantastic. Yeah, six million. It's, it's just yeah. six million wow. dollars. Uh, that, that's inc it's incredible. Uh, really good. <laughs> but it's a very good bundle. I think today is the last day, so if people are hearing mm. that, uh, yeah. Uh, we have Sardonicus in the the chat room who mentioned dragon, so he felt like that. If we mention white white dwarf. Imagine we need to mention Dragon as well. I think oh yes, yeah, yeah. Dragon was the TSR one, I f was it? Yeah, because that was Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine. Yes, that's a thing. Um, <laughs> why they didn't just stick the two together to make it Dungeons and Dragons magazine? But uh, never mind. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't think I ever read any of those ones. But I think that's mostly because I never ran D and D. I played a lot of D and D as a as a team. Um, but never actually ran it and to such an extent that um, our dungeon masters because we had three who took it in turns um, they were so protective about being dungeon master that we weren't the players weren't allowed to buy a copy of the DMG but I, I, I still only have a, have a player's handbook <laughs> I like to, to be honest. I like this concept, and we sort of had that when I played too. It was not specific to Dungeons and Dragons, but the idea was that game masters sort of owned a game, but it meant that mm -hmm. it it encouraged people to play different games. Like I know the reason I played Nephilim is because uh, the game master of Nephilim was about to buy uh, another game, and then his brother bought it before him. And his older brother bought it before him. It was, the older brother was one of our game masters. So, and then he said, he said, he told his little brother, "Well, you cannot buy this game anymore. It's mine. <laughs> it's my game now. So you cannot <laughs> read it because I'm gonna run it. And you cannot know the secrets in the book. So you need to buy another <laughs> book. So he picked up Nephilim, and that's how I found out about about it. But I thought I thought it was nice because. Then you, there's no such an hegemony of a single game because everybody needs to buy in a in a game group. Everybody have their game and they specialize in that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was, it was definitely like that with our our group. We had uh, one GM who really focused on um, who also ran Doctor Who and Star Trek. Uh, I think for me, I mostly ran Star Frontiers. Uh, and then later, James Bond and Indiana Jones. I, I really liked the Indiana Jones game that TSR brought out, and I'm going to get an awful lot of flack for that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, each each player had their own uh, their their own little game set, and we sort of flitted about. But but doing it that way, it meant that I think I was I was gaming sort of about five or six nights a week, which was great <laughs> when you're a teenager. <laughs> 
none, none of this going to the pub and being antisocial or anything like that. We were we were just sitting around people's dining rooms and playing RPGs every night of the week, just about. That's what you need to throw in your pitch for uh, the Ghostbusters game. Uh, it's not a, it's a antisocial behavior. Uh, what do you could call that? Re oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a game. <laughs> well, it's not. No, no. It's it's for it's for incre improving your social skills, definitely. <laughs> well, you... I, I've I've always always maintained that that, that was a, the, one of the things that I've always said whenever people have asked why RPGs are so important is because the first day job I had uh, I got because I played D and D. Because uh, the first the first proper job I I uh, I got after leaving school was uh, working for the local count, county council um, in their nature conservation department, uh, modifying their maps. Wow! And be, uh, and the um, the guy <laughs> interviewing me after, after I got the job and I started working there, the, the 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 guy who interviewed me, who was my immediate boss. He just said, you know, you, you got the job because you play D&D. &D. And I said, why is it? Because of the map making. And he says, no, 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 nothing to do with the maps because sure, that's an element to it, but it's because you have to work as a team and you have to solve puzzles and you sometimes have to think a bit laterally. And the other person who it was between you and somebody else, uh, they didn't they didn't play D&D, &D, so you got the edge and got, got that job. And it's that, well, if if D and D can get you a normal job, <laughs> so yeah, everybody should have a go. <laughs> yeah, I'm helping my wife rewrite her CV at the moment, and uh, you, you can find on the internet obscure but professional sounding ways to put uh, D and D and tabletop role playing games in your resume, like uh, uh, organize oh, a weekly social <laughs> social oh, yeah, exercise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> A weekly outing into the local <laughs> dungeon. <laughs> so uh, we are slowly running out of time. It's going to be time for me to go and wake up my son from his daily nap. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Is there is there anything else you wish? We can still discuss uh, uh, one more thing if you wish to. Is there anything you want to discuss to plug? Uh, I don't think so, except uh, if... You're interested in RPG a day? Uh, that's that will be starting first of August. Uh, as I say, it's the seventh year now. Uh, there's a Facebook page for it. Uh, if you go on there and uh, like the page, then the moment that the prompts are available, you'll see them there. I'm sure they'll circulate around the internet eventually. Uh, but if you can join in, that would be great. It's just a, a great way to try and keep people positive and share the the good experiences that they've had in, in rpgs and why rpgs are such fun and just to try and combat some of the negativity that was out there many years ago and still permeates through every now and then so so yeah try and stomp it out of the way by spreading the joy as they say and in the meantime you can already type on twitter and other social media hashtag RPG a day, and you'll find the content from the previous years, including my own on TikTok. Yes. I think I'm the only one on Excellent. TikTok doing RPG a day, so there should be I more. Admit, I, I haven't even installed TikTok yet, so that's another one for later. <laughs> <laughs> well, where can I, well, where can people find you if you wish to be found, David? Uh, most of the time, it's on my website, which is autocratic.com. Um, I know it sounds a bit of a strange one, but yeah, I, Autocratic came from the old days when I was a comic publisher back in the late 90s. And um, I kind of adopted it as a name because, you know, kind of like doing things my way. I don't get on well with others, as they say. <laughs> so it kind of worked as a good name for it. So, yeah, if you go to autocratic.com, uh, you'll probably see an awful lot of blog posts at the moment because it has been... A good way to keep sane during these lockdowns just blogging nonsense about favorite movies and games and stuff well i will include but, a, a um, direct link to your blog uh in the description of the episode so people are encouraged to go check it on youtube or if they're listening in audio just click on the episode and you should have everything you need there to, to find david 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm sure we'll interact more since then, but uh, worst case scenario, touching wood, uh, we will see each other <laughs> at Dragon Meet, and uh, hopefully uh, I will be able to play some wilds there. Cheers. Excellent. That'd be great. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> bye.